In that case, um, I'm going to push ahead to what was planned for uh, first thing post lunch, which is other TPM features. Um, this is something of a grab bag talk. Uh, because the TPM has a lot of different minor features that are worth discussing, that are not really significant enough to have a one-on-one -on -one talk of their own. Um, so we'll just go over several of them in no particular order to familiarize you with the concepts. If you really think one of these is especially interesting and you want to pause the talk to dig down a little deeper, go ahead and let me know. I will warn you in advance that I only actually use some of these. So how much digging I'll be able to do before saying, I'll look up the spec over lunch and get back to you, will vary. So, flags. Um, the TPM has a whole pile, and by a whole pile, I think we're looking at like a couple dozen um, flags that are values changeable by the owner or automatically set by the TPM in certain operations. Um, a lot of them are not really relevant in most scenarios. The fact of the matter is, you don't care whether the ownership flag is set, you care whether the TPM has an owner, and whether you've got the password to be the owner. Um, whether or not you can read the public endorsement key is a handy thing to know about. You can reset this flag, which will allow you to read the public endorsement key after the owner has been set. But fundamentally, if you've already issued an endorsement credential, you probably don't care that much. Um, it's handy, it's useful, but it's not a big deal. A couple of flags are actually very important. The big one, the one that we actually have recommendations <coughs> as to how you set it, uh, is the FIPS flag. Um, despite the fact that the, FIP, the, the TPM has not actually been FIPS certified, and in fact can't be FIPS certified, it does have a FIPS flag. The SIPS flag does not put the TPM into a FIPS approved mode because no such thing exists, but it gets it closer. Um, it sets a bare minimum threshold for security for a whole bunch of commands. For example, once the FIPS flag is set, um, you're not allowed to create 512 bit keys, that's too short. Once the FIPS flag has been set, you can't create legacy keys, they're insecure. Um, it basically, uh, you, you must have authorization values on all keys. You don't have to give them good authorization values. You can use the well-known secret, but an authorization value must be set. So FIPS, having the FIPS flag on is something that we expect most enterprises to want to do because it minimizes the amount you can shoot yourself in the foot by choosing the wrong option. So why, why do you say it would never become FIPS compliant? Um, there is some detail of the FIPS specification, mm -hmm. and all, I am not an expert in that, yeah. that happens to be contradicted by some of the things the TPM does. Uh, and I can't be more specific. I, I had somebody rant at me about this for about 20 minutes because the guy was very upset that the, the, the TPM had not cared enough about FIP certification to have met whatever this criteria was. Um, it didn't make much of an impression on me, so it doesn't, didn't, yeah. doesn't seem like it was a major security flaw. Mm -hmm. um, 2.0, the TPM work group cares a lot more. They don't want to deal with the same, well, we're not technically FIP certified. There are tiers of FIP certification, okay. and I believe that the TPM is getting about halfway up. Oh, wow. um, if you actually want the details, I can look them up, but I really don't know offhand. No, I'm just kind of curious if for them to call out, or does it actually stay in the spec if it refers to FIPS? The name of the flag is FIPS. So it's interesting because it, you know, it, it makes you go, oh, I was, I was really surprised when, yeah. when the guy from NIST right. told me the TPMs were not FIPS certified because I'm like, what do you mean? It's got a FIPS flag. Yeah. Of course it is. Right. Um, it's not. Okay. It is not for reasons that sound like they are a bit of a technicality. They took a different approach to certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but how much of a technicality it is probably depends on how much you care about whatever the difference was, and I don't know what the difference was. Okay. Uh, there's also an NV locked flag that uh, enables or disables all authorization checks on NVRAM, including whether or not you're the owner and whether or not the PCR values are actually checked. That's a pretty big deal. If you're using NVRAM for secure operations, you really care about whether this flag is set. Um, 
The intent of this flag is to allow the TPM manufacturer, who is creating the TPM, who wants to put, in theory, certificates into the TPM, to do so without being the owner. In theory, this flag does get set when you, you, you take ownership, or in theory, it should get set when the manufacturer is finished. That said, it's worth looking into, because if this gets turned off, some of your assumptions about whether it's safe to use NVRAM really do go away. Um, there are also a whole bunch of flags that are very useful if and only if you're in a, in a, in a specific corner case. For example, there is a flag, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, that indicates whether or not the endorsement key was created by the manufacturer versus a TPM command. If news comes down, yeah, if in two years we discover that, say, Broadcom has turned out to have an insecure endorsement key generation practice, then I really care about going through every single one of my Broadcom TPMs and checking this flag so I know which ones to stop trusting. Um, similarly, things like disable other clear. There's technically two, two ways to clear the TPM. We'll get to that later in this talk. One of which is force clear, which is what you do in the BIOS. You have physical presence. You force the TPM to be cleared. The other one of which is just a command that the owner can run that wipes the TPM. Um, whether or not you want that feature enabled depends a, a lot on what you want the default behavior of the TPM to be. If I'm an enterprise and I've given all of my users the owner password, I may well want to disable owner clear just to reduce the possibility that either a user will do something stupid or that malware that gets a hold of the owner password will, deny, will, will do a DOS attack on me remotely by running owner clear. Any responsible owners? Uh, there's only one TPM owner. If you want multiple owners, yeah. what you really want to do is look into the delegation uh, facility. Yeah. Uh, delegation is another one of those, I'm not talking about it today mostly because it's complicated. Okay. There are a lot of delegation commands. But the thing about delegation is it's extremely flexible. Mm -hmm. So in general, I rarely want there to be two TPM owners. Mm -hmm. I mostly want to say something like, I want the IT department to be the owner, but I don't want the user to have to go back to the IT department every time they want to do X. Because really, you rarely actually want everybody to have full administrative privileges to the TPM. And the point of those delegation privileges is that I don't need to be the owner or use the owner password mm -hmm. in order to do frequent operations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to go over the full list because it is, in fact, huge. <laughs> uh, what, uh, the disabled owner clear flag um, I'd have to actually look up which one it, what its default value is. It's in the table. Um, this one is actually deliberately set by the owner. So if you want it to be something other than the default value, you have to go in and change it yourself. Yes, the owner is the one that turns on or off the disable owner clear flag. This is not the weirdest piece of permissions in the TPM. The weirdest ones that I the, the weirdest one that I have found so far is if you want to read the values of the TPM flags, there's a command called get capability. Um, you need to be the owner to run get capability. One of the flags that you can only read via get capability is the flag that determines whether or not the TPM has an owner. So unless you have a TPM owner, you can't read the flag to determine whether an owner exists. Oh my god. <laughs> I found that one particularly funny. Um, but in general, um, it, it's, it's not just capability. There's a second one because there's technically two kinds of TBM flag. This is part of why I didn't go into the details because it's a bit grungy. Um, yeah. Um, if you actually care about those details, I have a little bit of prototype code that I can show somebody if they're curious about pulling values out of the TPM. I haven't yet managed to get all of it working yet, but there you go. Um, as I said, the, the full list of flags is in the spec. Um, the TPM spec is broken into three parts. Uh, part one is the design principles, part two is structures, and part three is commands. Mm -hmm. These flags are all listed in the structures spec. There's a very straightforward table. Um, and so if you want to know what the flags are, what you can use them for, how you change them, what the default values are, 
all of that is in the, the, the structures spec, except how you change them. And in that case, you have to go to the ENT commands and it's complicated. Um, I mentioned this even though I have mostly not been saying go look at the spec, because unlike everything else that you have to go look at the spec, this is actually one table. <laughs> it's comparatively very straightforward. Um, so, key migration. I talked in the uh, yesterday afternoon about the fact that keys can be migratable or non-migratable. And in pretty much every other talk, except for the one about binding keys, I have said use non-migratable keys. Now, that's because we've previously been talking about attestation, authentication, things where identity really matters. Um, that sound looks like the correct link for the TPM main specification, yes. Um, I don't know offhand. Um, for those of you who love the TPM main specification, you can, in fact, find it in the Trusted Community Group's website in the developer resources under TPM. Um, so, key migration is actually a feature that most enterprises care a lot about. We really want migratable keys, in particular because we care about backups and we care about the ability to replace the system without losing all of our data. So, migration is actually pretty darn straightforward. You can create a migratable key on TPMA. You can then use a create, basically create migration blob command, which re-encrypts the private hack of key K to some other key that is theoretically on TPMB. Now, the TPM has no way of knowing whether this other key actually is a TPM or not. It just gets what is claimed to be a public key, and it will re-encrypt to that public key. So this might be a TPM. This might be some server in a closet somewhere that just has a software key. This might be something that's publicly known. We have no way of knowing. So as part of that, the migration command requires that the owner authorize it. Or again, you can delegate the authority to migrate keys to somebody else. Um, now, when they blob, the blob can get sent over the wire, B will decrypt the blob, and K is now a key belonging to B, its parent key is, is on TPMB or non-TPMB as the case may be. Um, it is important to note that this does not make K unavailable to the original TPM. Um, the TPM doesn't have a list of keys. They're not all internally stored. You remember, key, TPM keys are stored in blobs on the disk. So the migration command, you take a loaded key, you re-encrypt it, you send it off. Um, I can then later on come along with the original key blob for K and load it. So there are actually a number of scenarios besides backup where we see people talking about these. Um, we have seen people talk about I have a server cluster that has five machines in it. I want them to have a unified identity. You can use TPM keys to do this and certify migratable keys where I can certify that these will never actually go to something that is not a TPM are partly intended for that scenario where I want to establish trust in a key, but the key is not held on one machine. That's what certified migratable keys are for. Similarly, if I, as an enterprise, want to be quite certain that once I've exported the backup migratable key, it's not getting exported anywhere else, I can potentially create a certified migratable key, certify that, and the migration authority, which is part of what that certification process approves of, is going to be some machine in my IT department. So we've got several tiers of trust involved in migration. Um, if I'm just using migration to create a key on my TPM that I want you to have, I don't need to worry about any of that. I can just send it across. Or if I really do care, I can create a certified migratable key where I'm the migration authority and send it to you because I'm not going to let you send it anywhere else. So there are options. Um, they tend to get a little complicated, which is why they're not on the slide. But this is what migration is really for and why it's really handy. Oh, I did put a slide in about certified migratable keys. Awesome. Um, so migratable keys don't migrate directly from TPM to TPM. 
They migrate to a migration authority, which will then verify and migrate them to a final destination. You basically got a trusted third party built into the system. Um, the owner approves the, the migration authorities. Um, and as I said, when we certify migratable keys, we are certifying the type of the key and the authority that is its migration authority. So this is more complicated. You have to give it way more options when you create one of these. Migrating them is a multi-step process because you're migrating them via multiple machines. Um, but you do get a lot more assurance. Ariel, that can you remind us how exactly you designate or indicate the authority which you're migrating it to? Is it like host names? What is it? Okay. Public key. Um, in general, most operations for a TPM, if we're talking about an identity, the, the identity is really the key. Um, in part because that's the one that we have assurance for. The TPM knows it's migrating to that migration authority because it is encrypting the key to that public key. Um, TPM's host names mean nothing to a TPM. So if you want to identify the migration authority, it's because you have a certificate that says this public key belongs to migration authority X with host name Y. Um, yep. Does that cover? So, monotonic counters are these really awesome uh, kind of side case features where it's exactly what it sounds like. They are guaranteed to always increase over time. Um, they are always deliberately implemented. These are not clocks. Um, and they are very useful if you're doing internal freshness checking. Um, you cannot sign a counter value for remote parties, but you can use it locally to make sure that you're not loading old saved data by including a value in your, in your, um, in your data. And whenever you unload the data, you increment the counter. Now you can't be tricked into loading your old data again. Um, there's no burnout from the monotonic counters. You can, in fact, um, create multiple monotonic counters, even though there's only really one internally in the TPM. Um, I'll be perfectly honest. I have not really looked into the details of how it works, but it seems kind of reasonable. Um, the idea here is that if I have three different applications all using a monotonic counter, I don't have to worry about the fact that your application updated your monotonic counter because I have my own. And there's a limited number that the TPM has. This is one of those things you can read out of the TPM flags. Um, that, that one's not really a flag. It's just a piece of data. But you can, you can read it anyway. Um, so that I can say, I want a new monotonic counter as long as the, the set of monotonic counters available have not been uh, changed or are not fully, fully allocated. I can allocate my own. I can update it at my heart's content. And then later on, when I no longer want it again, I can deallocate it. All monotonic counters that are not the basic counter are wiped when, when the machine, uh, when like owner, when it's cleared. Yeah. Um, I believe that the way the, the different counters work is that they're basically doing delta from the TPM's internal counter. I don't actually remember when you update the internal counter versus those counters. But every single one of them has this property that they only go forward. Uh, monotonic counters have handles much like keys do. Um, so tick counters. Tick counters are the TPM's answer to clocks. TPM doesn't have a clock. It has no concept of external absolute time. What it does have is a count from the start of the last tick session. Um, it is supposed to be the last startup of the machine. This is not actually guaranteed, as with many things in the TPM. The spec contains a should rather than a must. Um, I believe that has to do with how much power you may or may need. So the TPM has less guaranteed behavior if you are rebooting, doing a soft reboot rather than a hard reboot, because a lot of things use power detection. I believe the reason this is a should is if the power was not completely lost, you're not guaranteed to reset it. But I'm not positive. Um, this gives you a counter 
that is combined with a nonce. The nonce identifies the tick session. Whenever a new tick session is created, a fresh nonce is generated and stored inside the TBM, which gives you the chance to do, um, and then you have the, a counter that increments once every time period. And I believe it's a pretty small time period. Um, Zeno can probably actually tell more here, because I think you're actually using them. I never have. Um, this counter increments with some frequency and, and some reliability. And the TPM will sign a concatenation of the current value of that counter with the current value of the nonce. Um, again, use an identity key. This means that if I have a, t a tick stamp um, from some previous uh, uh, connection with the TPM and a tick stamp now, I can get a relative value of time that is actually signed by the TPM. Um, it will break over a reboot. And in fact, once there's a reboot, I don't know how many reboots there are. But, because, uh, you know, it's a nonce. This is not a session incrementer. But, as long as the machine has not rebooted, I can't actually tell approximate time. And it's actually way more accurate than we expected. Um, different frequencies on different TPMs. Yeah, the, the spec actually includes a pro recommended protocol for calibrating the tick counter of a given TPM with a clock. It's, it's, an, it's an informative session. It's a little bit complicated, but you can do it. This really is usable as long as what you care about is short-term time, not long-term time. Um, so um, I have been informed that this is actually accurate enough that we can use it for what's called timing-based attestation, where I want to identify, uh, to, to make sure an operation has happened only on this machine by doing a challenge and timing how long that challenge takes and um, taking into account the, the network delay. So I can be, have some assurance that that operation was not forwarded to somewhere else. And this is actually a really handy trick if we're trying to do things like um, make sure that this smart card is authenticating at the same via this hardware machine because I can do a tick stamp, do an attestation with the smart card, do a tick stamp, and, and associate all of that. It's hard, but you can do it. Um, oh, you're not using network delay with the tick counter? No. These, these things to, yeah, two tick stamp deltas is, is, is most of what I'm looking at. Cool. Good to know. Um, what does RTT stand for? The, the, the comment here is we either use network RTT or use two tick stamp deltas. And two tick stamp deltas is a technique that I'm most familiar with. But uh, uh, round trip time. Right. I've never actually done timing based out station myself. So I'm, I'm really talking theoretical, uh, th theoretically here. And Zeno is pointing out that I don't know everything that I'm talking about here, and I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, two separate, separate ways of doing timing-based attestation. One is the delta between two tick counters locally, and one is uh, based on network time assumptions. So um, gosh, we are just zipping through things today. Um, so the TPM can also act as a random number generator. Um, I get asked a lot, how good is the TPM as a random number generator? And unfortunately, the answer is, we don't know. It's manufacturer dependent. The manufacturers do not publicize their random number generation techniques. Um, they spec recommends that they use hardware-based entropy, not just a pseudo-random number generator, but they're not required to. So we don't have any idea. Um, the bytes um, in the random number generator are retrievable via the get random command. And you can add entropy from external sources using a stir random command, which adds bits of entropy provided by the user to the TPM's random number generator. One of the things that we are adding to our research list now is testing what happens if you add non-random numbers via stir random and what, what that does. Um, Stir random does not replace the TPM's seed with whatever you provided. It does combine them, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can reduce the entropy value if you do so maliciously. Um, 
And the last topic is clearing the TPM. So when I want to dispose of a machine, I've got a TPM, it's got a whole lot of secrets in it that I want to get rid of. What I want to do is clear it. And there's two different approaches to clearing the TPM. One of which is through the BIOS, where um, there's, you have to enable a command called force clear. Or the TPM owner clear command, which similarly must be separately enabled. So there's basically two flags saying which kind of clear are enabled. Neither of them has to actually be enabled. Um, not all BIOSes support force clear. If you go into the BIOS when you are turning on the TPM, you will often, but not always, see an option that says clear or erase or reset. Um, if your BIOS doesn't have that option, it doesn't matter whether you've got force clear turned on, you're going to have a little trouble using it. In theory, the only requirement for force clear is that you have physical presence, but there's a bit of a difference between, in theory, I have physical presence and actually implementing it. Um, there is a physical presence flag that the that gets turned on if you have booted the machine with physical presence enabled, which is what is checked when force clear is called. Um, but actually implementing that in software is a little bit of a pain. Um, what clear does is it erases all non-permanent data. The owner is erased. Key storage is erased. Um, uh, in FIPS mode, if the bit slide is turned on, it is not merely cleared, it is actually overwritten with zeros. Um, the flags are reset to the default value. Um, any NVRAM that belonged to any that, that was not allocated by the manufacturer is deallocated. Um, and in general, if there's something that seems to be um, non-permanent, it's gone. There are a few things that say. The endorsement key is not cleared on a clear. Even if you have a revocable endorsement key, it is not cleared on a clear. You have to actually explicitly revoke it. And the monotonic counter, because after all, the whole point of the monotonic counter is it's guaranteed to never go backwards. The monotonic counter will never go backwards, even on a clear. It's not like it goes back to zero. It stays at whatever it was. So those are the only things that remain. Um, when it comes to things like what a cleared TPM does, if it's activated but cleared, um, even if the TPM is, has no owner, when you reboot the machine, if the TPM is active, the PCRs will get filled in on boot. It's just part of the, the, the operation. Um, so that does not really count as part of non-permanent data because it is so non-permanent that it's per boot anyway. But anything that is secret, anything that you actually may care about, is erased. And once you have cleared the data, there is cleared the TPM, there's no way to reconstruct any of that. So for most enterprises, you probably do want to turn on FIPS mode. If, even if you're not using it normally, which you should be, you probably do want to do it for uh, doing a clear. But this is going to be the safe way to hand off your TPM to somebody else. So. Um, Wow, we are running ahead here. Um, the other thing that I'm going to talk about very briefly without a slide because I don't happen to have it convenient um, is Zeno had asked yesterday about dictionary attack protection. The good news is the TPM is absolutely required to have dictionary attack protection to make sure that authorization values um, for any key or for the TPM itself cannot be brute forced with a dictionary attack. The bad news is that is as specific as the specification gets. Um, there are some recommendations about ways that you can solve this. Um, the, the TPM might require the system to reboot before you can, you can add, uh, test more authentication values. Um, it may lock the TPM either for a certain time window or um, permanently until you run a, a reset command. But they don't specify which ones you should take. The only thing that is required in the spec is that if you do lock the TPM, uh, regardless of whether it's for a time window or something longer, there is the TPM owner gets exactly one chance to run a command that will reset the flag that basically says, um, turn off the dictionary attack protection. 
Um, so that is unfortunately all I can tell you because it's going to depend on the individual TPM. The TPMs that I have used previously, I have run into the dictionary attack protection of temporary time locks where once you've tried the password a certain number of times, and I honestly don't know where because I was trying to do uh, code testing, so I didn't realize I triggered the dictionary attack protection for quite some time. Um, the uh, TPM would not let me test that again for a couple of hours. So it depends on the manufacturer, and they aren't specific about it. So that is, a, a, unfortunately, all I can tell you, much like a random number generator, We've got requirements, but the requirements are so hand wavy that you'd have to do much more serious testing and risk breaking the team.